Hello, everybody, and welcome to week three of the semester. I hope everyone's classes are going okay and that you're all starting to make sense of the somewhat bewildering new learning environment that is online education. This week in the history of medicine, we're journeying to the East to look at one of the world's oldest, longest lasting medical systems, Ayurveda. For the better part of the last 2000 years, Ayurveda has been the dominant form of medicine practiced in India. It emerged at a time when India was becoming an economic and political powerhouse on the Asian subcontinent, and today Ayurveda has become a global phenomenon. So what exactly is Ayurveda? Where did it come from? And to what extent was it a scientific form of medicine? In getting at this first question, uh, that is about Ayurveda's status as a science, we're going to learn today about something called the conflict thesis. So our second question is, what is the conflict thesis and how valid is it? Uh, to what extent does it act accurately capture the relationship between science and religion in ancient India? These are some of the big questions we'll be grappling with this week starting today. Okay, so first, some of the basics. Ayurveda literally means the knowledge for longevity, or in other words, the knowledge of how to live to a ripe old age. As this suggests, Ayurveda is not just about curing diseases, but about preventative measures and general strategies for improving health. While it is not entirely clear when Ayurveda first emerged, most historians cite three particular doctors as its founders. The first, an individual named Charaka, who lived somewhere between 100 BCE and 200 CE and wrote an important text called the Charaka Samhita. Samhita being the Sanskrit word for compendium, just so you know. The second key figure is Sushruta, who lived several hundred years earlier, probably between seven and 900 BCE. Sushruta is known as the father of surgery and he is associated with a treatise called the Sushruta Samhita. And third, Vagvata, a Buddhist follower of Charaka and Sushruta whose works, which were written around 650 CE, he often cites. These three individuals are sometimes called the Holy Trinity of Ayurveda. While they sometimes put forward very different ideas as to the causes and cures of illness, from ancient times there is a core of ideas that we could call Ayurvedic. So what are these? Moderation is of particular importance, as all of the classic texts I just mentioned talk about how in order to maintain health, one must be sure to never have too much or too little food, sleep, exercise, and sex. Illness was seen as the result of imbalance, particularly imbalance between three bodily forces, which were called doshas. The three doshas were wind, phlegm, and bile. When dealing with a sick person, the job of the physician was to determine which of the doshas was not flowing properly and to then figure out how to restore an orderly flow. Ayurvedic texts stress the idea that there is no single remedy of capable of restoring an individual to health. Each person's condition had to be studied carefully before prescribing treatment. And in terms of treatments, Ayurveda encompasses a wide range of therapies, including herbs, broths, oils and ointments, enemas, massage, douches, sudation, that is sweating, and surgery. Ayurvedic drugs consisted of animal, vegetable, and mineral substances. And Ayurveda itself had eight different branches. Internal medicine, diseases of the eye, ear, nose, throat, and mouth, surgery, as we said, toxicology, the treatment of demonic seizures, which sometimes people call psychology, pediatrics, geriatrics, aphrodisiacs, and reproductive medicine. Among the medical cultures of antiquity, 
Ayurveda was somewhat unique in the emphasis that it placed on surgery. The Sushruta Samhita discusses this in great detail and describes a great number of operations. Some of these were quite challenging, like cesarean sections, lithotomy, that is the removal of bladder stones, and couching the cataract for people who had vision problems. There were also procedures for opening the chest, drain pus, and for repairing torn intestines and bellies. When doing surgery, doctors made use of a variety of different knives, needles, clips, and threads. Ayurvedic texts offer detailed descriptions of these so-called 101 surgical instruments needed for the correct performance of these procedures. On account of all of these things, some scholars argue that Ayurveda was a scientific form of medicine. For example, in his 1977 book, Science and Society in Ancient India, Devi Prasad Chattopadhyaya writes that in Ayurveda, we see doctors taking what he calls, quote, the momentous step from magico-religious therapeutics to rational therapeutics. Scholars like these see in early Ayurveda a medical tradition that is grounded in observation and experience, that is empirical, rational, and materialistic. They see it as something that is logical and that revolves around concrete biological realities. To be sure, they admit that ancient Ayurveda fails to meet some of today's criteria for what constitutes a science. Early Ayurvedic writings contain no procedures for quantitatively evaluating the efficacy of different remedies, for example. They contain no method for testing hypotheses and no system of experimentation such as controlled clinical trials. Yet, while it may not be scientific in the modern sense, scholars like Chattopadhyaya argue that Ayurveda from its ancient times is nevertheless scientific in a general sense. As the historian Francis Zimmerman concludes in his 1987 book, Ayurveda, quote, represents the seeds of secular thought. Because it largely dispenses with religion, magic, and supernatural phenomenon, it is deserving of the label scientific, these scholars argue. When these scholars encounter references to gods, spirits, and other immaterial forces in early Ayurvedic literature, and there are some. Um, for example, what we said, the branch of medicine that deals with demonic seizures. They tend to write them off as inauthentic. That is, as things that these writers didn't actually believe, but had to say, uh, because they wanted to please people's religious sensibilities not wishing to offend religious elites, they occasionally bowed to the prevailing Hindu orthodoxy because these early Ayurvedic doctors didn't want to endanger their own practices and livelihoods. In other words, these physicians knew that their own ideas about health were in conflict with those of the general public, and they took steps so as to minimize the potential damage they might do themselves by openly rejecting religion. They practiced self-censorship. According to Chattopadhyaya, references to things like demonic seizures are nothing more than, as he put it, quote, ransoms offered to the counter-ideology, the stamp of religion given on science with the hope of making it acceptable. But Ayurvedic doctors didn't actually believe in things like demonic seizures, the argument goes, because Doing this would be impossible while also subscribing to a secular, materialistic worldview. The interpretation of Ayurveda laid out in the previous two slides provides an example of what is often called the conflict thesis. The conflict thesis is an attempt to understand the relationship between science and religion, and it contends that these two things are fundamentally incompatible with each other. It originated in the work of two 19th century American scholars, Andrew Dickinson White and John William Draper. Both Draper and White were active supporters of Charles Darwin, whose theory of evolution was a subject of heated debate in the mid 1800s. Seeing how fervently some members of the clergy opposed Darwin's ideas, Draper and White believed that their opposition to natural selection was 
but the latest chapter in Christianity's long-running hostility toward science. In their writings, which included Draper's History of the Conflict Between Religion and Science, from 1874, and White's A History of the Warfare of Science with Theology in Christendom, from 1896, these men argued that the relationship between science and religion was characterized by violent, irreconcilable antagonism. Both believed that religion and science were locked in a perpetual conflict, an ongoing historical struggle whose outcome would determine the fate of humanity. They believed that religion's animosity towards science had led people to oppose the use of anesthetics, to oppose vaccination, and in particular to oppose Darwin's theory of evolution. On the screen here, you can read an excerpt from a lecture Draper gave in 1869. It's called The Battlefields of Science, and it demonstrates some of the essentials of the Draper-White thesis, as it is also called, while also making clear which side of this conflict Draper was on. For a long time, the conflict thesis governed the way that historians looked at science and religion, but in the early 1990s, they started to reevaluate this thesis. For example, in his book Science and Religion, Some Historical Perspectives from 1991, John Brooke suggested that the conflict thesis be replaced by what he called the complexity thesis, which viewed science and religion in a variety of different relationships, some conflictive, but some also more harmonious. Following up on this influential book, a number of studies documented examples in the past of religion actually nurturing and encouraging science. Other studies published in the aftermath of Brooks' book describe situations in which science and religion coexisted without either conflict or an attempt to harmonize them. Despite all of these counterexamples, today, the idea that science and religion are totally opposed to each other remains quite popular. Prominent scientists still subscribe to it, including the famous physicist Stephen Hawking, who in a, in a 2010 interview declared that, quote, there is a fundamental difference between religion, which is based on authority, and science, which works on observation and reason. Science will win because it works. Similarly, in their book War of the Worldviews, Science versus Spirituality, Deepak Chopra and Leonard Mladenov argue that science and religion are not only at odds with each other, but also in active conflict with each other. And as we've already seen, those who argue that Ayurveda was a scientific form of medicine are also saying that, or, sorry, are also articulating an argument informed by and in line with the conflict thesis. In saying that the religious references in Ayurvedic writings are incompatible with their overall scientific bent, historians like Charapadhyaya and Zimmerman are making a more general argument about the incompatibility of science and religion. Importantly, however, there are some that contest this reading of ancient Ayurvedic literature. Most notably, in a 2003 essay on this subject, Stephen Engler argues that, quote, there is no categorical opposition between religion and science in early Ayurveda. According to Engler, the modern categories of science and religion have been imposed on these texts in a way that distorts them. Later in the week, we're going to have an opportunity to talk about Engler's essay and to also examine some Ayurvedic literature for ourselves. But before we get to this, I'd like to open a general discussion on the conflict thesis. Do you agree with the idea that science and religion are in competition with each other? Are there lots of conceptual tensions between these things? And if so, where do you see evidence of this sharp division? And if you don't see it in terms of conflict, how do you think we should characterize the relationship between religion and science? Do these things overlap? Do they support each other? Are they in separate domains? Is it even helpful to use these categories when talking about history, society, and culture? Once you've had a chance to think these things over, head on over to our discussion board and share your thoughts. I'm really interested to know what you have to say about this and look forward to discussing the conflict thesis with you further.